Welcome, everybody. My name is Christian Talbot. I am the president of the Middle States Association, and I am thrilled to welcome you today to our webinar on the future and the present of AI in learning. This is part of our ongoing series. Uh, this year, the theme is change makers in education, and there's no more urgent and important topic on that question than the role of AI in great learning experiences. Um, especially responsible AI and learning experiences. We consider this to be one of the forces at play, a, a kind of massive tectonic shift that's taking place now and is likely to affect education over the next decade and beyond. So this is a, both a timely and long-term conversation. And when we think about success for today, uh, there's hopefully three things that you're gonna gain a, a keener understanding of. First, what's the present state of AI and learning? Second, what are some choices about what we're going to face next? And third, what are some practical steps that you and your colleagues can take to create the conditions for the responsible use of AI and learning? And I am so happy to be in conversation about all of those things with my colleague and friend, Amanda Bickerstaff. I wanna tell you a little bit about Amanda and then set the context for the conversation. So Amanda is a longtime ed tech leader um, most recently, she founded and is the CEO of AI for Education, and she started her career in the classroom. One of the things I um, admire and respect most about Amanda is that she, she knows what it's like to be in the classroom with the kids, um, and she brings that mindset to all of these conversations and the work that she and her colleagues are doing at AI for Education, uh, mostly STEM subjects in um, some high-need New York City schools. Uh, including my hometown borough of the Bronx. And um, finally, I would say that if you're not following Amanda on LinkedIn, you absolutely should be. Um, she posts regularly. And I would say uh, Amanda is all stake and no sizzle. Everything she posts is substantive. Um, she's one of the most important people I go to um, on LinkedIn to find out what's going on and more importantly, how to make sense of what's going on. Um, so, uh, again, if you're not following on LinkedIn, I, I strongly encourage you to, to check out her presence there. So I just want to set a kind of context for this conversation, because I think these numbers speak to just how profound the gap is between, um, what people believe and what people are doing. And, uh, depending on the day, you know, there's so many poll surveys out there and so much changes week to week. Um, as we learn uh, sometimes the hard way with generative AI in particular, it's kind of hard to keep track of, of, of numbers. But directionally, I see things coming up that look like something that um, Kareem Lakani recently shared. He is a professor at Harvard Business School. And when he talks with audiences, which is you know multiple times a week, he asks them three questions. He asks them, how many people have used generative AI? Second, how many believe that it's likely to have a significant impact on their own personal careers and on their organizations in the next three years? And the third question he asks is, um, how often do you use generative AI? So on the first question, he has discovered that about 90% of people who are in the workforce, so not just schools, but in the workforce, um, use have used generative AI, 90%. And 70 to 80%, depending on the audience, believe it's going to have a significant impact on their careers personally and on their organizations generally in the next three years. So a kind of a short time frame. But he's discovered that less than 10% of those same people use generative AI every day. And there could be lots of reasons for this. Maybe we'll get into some of those now. Um, and uh, I think it, it speaks to what school leaders in particular need to be considering in terms of the impact and the the day to day reality, before I ask uh, Amanda the first question, I just want to draw your attention to two things in the chat section. So my colleague uh, Audrey Chin here from Middle States has posted two links 
first is a link to a um, one question survey, and it's actually literally a one word question. Um, put in your one word. Uh, that's the first link, and it's www.menti.com with a little extension. And then the second link is a Google Doc that you all have editing rights to. And we've posted some prompts for conversation um, that will be based on both what we're talking about here, um, as well as things that might come up between you and other webinar participants. So we hope you find both of those things useful and helpful. So with all that said, Amanda, thank you for being here. And I wanna ask you the first question, which is you've had a long career in education and in particularly ed tech. So what is AI for education and why did you found it? Well, thank you so much for having me here. Um, and thank you for everyone joining. Um, we really appreciate your engagement in this important topic. And as someone said, um, we, you know, the idea of leading from the front, uh, Middle States Association is absolutely doing that. And it's, it's incredibly important between this work, um, the commitment to this, and also the, you know, the work that we're doing on the advisory board towards an endorsement and, and supporting uh, schools like yours to making some good decisions about how to start adopting these tools in a, in a responsible and, and productive manner. So um, yeah, AI for Education is a, a, a funny story. And since Shirley, um, you know, as a former teacher and a curriculum developer and designer and editor, I really don't like writing rubrics. Um, I mean, I, I, no offense to rubrics everywhere, but like I find them very difficult to write, um, whether it's figuring out the criteria, how to like, you know, set out the table, you know, going from few to many to some, you know, like all the things that are such a kind of important component of these, uh, you know, rubrics that are important. We want students to understand how they will be assessed. Um, and, but, you know, I have been in positions where when a company right out of grad school, you know, 600 rubrics that I reviewed or wrote in less than two years, and I'm still a broken person from that. Like it definitely still, you know, it, it, I have nightmares occasionally in rubrics, but when I came to generative AI for the first time, it was my natural instinct to try something for educators and and you know my my life after teaching has been one that's taken me many places including uh running an ed tech in australia but i have never really gotten away from i think wanting to support teachers to support students and so i typed in a pretty terrible you know not a good prompt like it was just simply like write a rubric on a um lab report on mitosis former science teacher and when it wrote me a rubric that was pretty darn good in 10 seconds and then automatically formatted it in a chart, uh, uh, that was when I knew two things. One was that there, this is the transformational technology we've been talking about for a long time. And as a former ed tech CEO, I know how hard it's been to actually meet that promise. Like it, it was, it's, you know, that we don't do a great job of providing education technology tools that actually drive better learning or better outcomes. And so I just realized very quickly that this is going to be something that had this power to save teachers time, increase productivity, personalized learning, et cetera. Um, but then I also realized that this is not an intuitive technology, nor is it a technology that we have anything that really has come before that we can apply to this. And knowing that we were coming off of code fatigue and, you know, teacher burnout and, and students isolation and all these things that are happening in school, school safety, um, that this is going to be extremely hard to adopt as an education ecosystem. So I started AI for Education literally as a website with a prompt library. So if you if you are a Gen AI user, you know that when you interact with ChatGPT or another tool, you're prompting it. So you're actually becoming a computer scientist in that moment because the computer science language of right now is actually English. And so when you get in there and build that, like, so I just built these prompts, I put it into the world um, and started talking about it. So I think that's how we actually met Christian is that I started, I had not posted on LinkedIn for a year and I'm very on LinkedIn, but I started posting these things about like, how do you make sense of something like um, the Department of Education's order, like, you know, the paper like four months ago, that was 75, you know, five pages very hard to read. So what can I do to help distill that? And that's how I got started. And through that, it became really clear that there was this need for practical um, and thoughtful and intentional advice around what Gen AI is, 
the applicate like the potential impact on schools and education and then how do you actually go and do it so that's how I started the organization and I get to do amazing work with uh, everything from students to teachers to leaders to associations like this one um, around the world and it is the most fun I've ever had. That's awesome. A couple of things before I ask you my next question. First, for the audience, if you didn't see it, um, we've put into the chat a link to the um, the prompt library from AI for Education. It is superior. I haven't even gone through all of it, but um, pretty much anything that you can imagine as an as a teacher, a classroom teacher, or even as an administrator, you're going to find a, a really high quality resource there. So I strongly encourage you. Um, to open that. And also it's in the Google Doc as well. Second, um, you know, Amanda, you said two things that really jump out at me and speak to why we're here. And then I want to piggyback on that for the next question. You said that you want to support teachers because they're the ones supporting the students. And I couldn't agree more. You know, in the middle states now where we have over 2 million students among our schools, but we know that we can only serve those students by supporting the teachers who are doing that work. And connected to that is your, your comment that the purpose of thinking about and working with AI for education, not just your company, but the, the, the work itself, is about better learning and better outcomes. Um, and I think that's a critical question. I have a whole separate thing about that later on. But for now, um, when you think about better learning and better outcomes, are there any high quality things that you are seeing schools doing right now in the present with AI and learning? It's a really good question because um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you know this technology is less than a year old. So ChatGPT was released to the world on uh, November 30th last year. And as any new technologies, these, these if in the first year, even the first five, you have a lot of um, issues around that technology. And right now, what I would say is that there is not any fit for purpose generative AI tool that you can release to students right now in unsupervised ways. And in fact, I would I would question even in supervised ways. And so ChatGPT, for example, it makes stuff up, which is called hallucinations. It has significant bias, um, especially against, you know, it's it's got a very kind of global north and or even I would say American bias around beauty standards, race, um, religion, um, you know, gender, et cetera. And so you have those things. And then you also have um, this, th the things that it cannot do, like it's not very good at math or reasoning. So what that means though, is that the tools that we have right now do have enormous power um, but they also are really inconsistent and, and unreliable and at times unsafe. So that means is when we think about for learning, do have I seen a lot of great examples of a generative AI tool in the classroom? The answer is in points, like in points in time, whether it's our curriculum, it kind of teaches you how to like a spot a hallucination or to understand the difference between thinking and computing. Um, and like the idea that, um, you know, understanding like how to use that and teaching critical use has been happening. And then there are individual classrooms and, and schools that really encourage students to use these tools and, 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 you know, with guidelines and with support. And there are tools on the market every day that are coming out that are aiming to be more safe and responsible. So I don't want to say like, I, I say don't buy anything right now, but if you want to pilot something that you really believe in in a structured manner that has an evidence space that is thinking about safety, that is mitigating bias in their model, and that is lowering hallucinations, or at least identifying where hallucinations can happen, then I would say absolutely do that. But And that's where we see the best practices happening. There are other examples of organizations like LAUSD, like the, the district in, in LA or others in New York City has a Microsoft partnership that are building towards, uh, you know, tools that are specific to their use cases and needs. And so there are opportunities as well. Those things I hate to tell everybody are very, very expensive, but they will come down in price and that's going to be very positive. What I see instead is that what's happening is the way that this is really helpful now is supporting your teachers and your leaders to use these tools thoughtfully and critically to support their productivity, to support their planning, to support their work. And so if you can do that, and at the same time, start freeing them up to focus more on learning outcomes, relationships in the classroom, opportunities to connect, to understand, to move kids forward, 
And that is the best thing you can do right now. And of course, be careful. I mean, you don't want to be like the Australian, you know, um, academics that are getting sued by KPMG because they use BARD and it made up some fake legal <laughs> like things. You don't want your teachers to use it uncritically, right? But if they're using it to, let's say, one of my favorite anecdotes is our exit ticket um, prompt, you know, this lovely teacher um, was like, okay, I'm going to use this prompt. And it built her like five really good exit tickets. And her response was not, I'm going to go pick the best one for my students, but I'm going to now give them those five and let them choose their opportunity to share. And so it took her from the moment of what is the best for my students to let's give them choice and agency. And I think that is the best way that we can support this usage while building everyone's AI literacy, because that's going to be so important. Yeah, you said two things that I want to follow up on. Um, one, it's it's so important. I'm guilty of forgetting this all the time, um, but the tools that are widely available now are very much built upon and designed for a global North audience. And there's that's just sort of like the tip of the tip of the bias iceberg. Um, and I suspect that most people who are here today are aware of that. Um, and someone in the chat um, even mentioned, um, I think uh, Amna mentioned that um, it's also an opportunity to develop tools for the global South and, and for higher ed as well. But um, I'm really glad that you called that out because that's that's uh, it's like the water that I swim in, but it's not the water that, you know, a huge chunk of the world swims in. And um, as educators, we really need to think about that. The second thing that I'd love for you to say more about, um, and I have the benefit of having talked to you a few times about this, but but for our audience, you've, you've said that um, right now there is no generative AI that is fit for purpose. I think that's a really critical phrase. And if you could just unpack that phrase and what that means in terms of implications for use by teachers and then use by students. Yeah, no, I, and I, I think for like, whether you want to call it fit for purpose or purpose built, um, is that, you know, we know that education has a, a very significant set of needs, so to speak. Like, you know, we have things around safety, we have things around privacy, we have things around learning science, and we have things around just making sure that these tools do not cause harm, right? Like our job as teachers and leaders is to ensure that our students have the best path forward and that we lower those opportunities, like we lower the harm and we, and we open up the opportunities for um, advancement, for learning, for engagement, for, our, for happiness even, like, like those moments that we can do. And so right now what we have is you have generative AI, we have foundational mo models. So these foundational models, when I say that, these are going to be these big models like ChatGPT. If you're familiar with BARD, which is Google's um, version of the chatbot, it's, it's Palm 2. Or you've got, if you've used Claude, which I like quite a bit for um, uh, writing, which is going to be anthropic. These foundational models are really, really big and very, very expensive. Um, and so, for example, ChatGPT costs $100 million to train and release. And so they have 2,000 engineers. It's a, it's a big, big, big machine. And these foundational models are the ones that kind of power Magic School or Diffit or um, if you use Carapod, if you, I'm going to throw names at you, everybody. But those are kind of three common uh, tools and um, uh, that are used by teachers specifically. And they are, that's how this works, is our power by that. Even Conmigo is powered by ChatGPT3. I'm oh, sorry, but ChatGPT4. Um, and so what we see is that these foundational models are not really designed for schools. Definitely not. Like they know that they're an education use case. Absolutely. In fact, there was a dip in July on, on ChatGPT usage and everyone's like, oh, the hype cycle is done. But you know what it was? Is that kids were out of session and teachers were out of session. So it went right back up in August. And so there's clearly a knowledge that these tools are used in schools um, and for educational purposes, but they're not designed for that. You know what they're designed for? Is they're designed for, you know, kind of seeing what the technology can do, pushing us forward, but also making money being very sticky, making sure you use it, making sure other people use it. And so that is not necessarily the, the right incentive of creating a safe, responsible, uh, intentional uh, tool that you follow, you know, a, a roadmap in which you've prioritized privacy, safety, you know, et cetera. And so when I say that is that that is going to be what powers what we see that is supporting teachers. And, and everything that kind of happens, whether that's GPT-4 now being able to see a, a picture of you and talk about it, 
is that those things are, are going to have rampant bias or they're going to mess up and have hallucinations. And so when I think about that, like w- there are more and more opportunities to create point solutions that are going to um, be able to be trained specifically on the documentation, a balanced data set, um, and then employed in specific ways. And I think that more and more we're seeing, I, w- I don't want to get too technical, but there are new techniques that kind of lower these this issues with hallucinations and that are really specifically built for the outcome. So for example, I went to a dinner last night. I am in a motel, a, a very fancy motel in Palo Alto. I was at a conference yesterday at Stanford and got to go to dinner around AI ethics, which is just so very much me that of course that would be the thing that I do is like, let's have a dinner around AI ethics. I'm like, yes, let's do it. Um, but talking with Merlin Mind, who are trying to build, they have a voice assistant and they're working towards safe and responsible purpose-built Uh, large language model for the classroom. And so that's going to be an example of what I hope to see more and more is that we have these these really, really um, purposeful, intentional, and safe tools that can really drive that learning. Yeah. Awesome. I think you've already addressed this a little bit, but um, my last question on the present state of of AI and learning is, um, are there things that a typical school leader might not entirely understand. You've talked about some of the bias, about the lack of purpose uh, or fit for purpose. Anything else that a typical school leader maybe might not quite understand about AI and and education right now? So we do, we start every kind of introduction to generative AI the same way, which is that one is that AI is not new. Um, And so artificial intelligence that, you know, has been around since the 50s. The first chatbot was in the 1960s. It was named Eliza, um, you know, and so I think that and, we, and about 84 percent of people interact with AI writ large, not just generative AI every day. And we do that through our phones, through our, you know, the way that we shop, the way that we interact with our music, et cetera, that artificial intelligence is, is not a, a new field we have generative AI that is also not new because you have Watson, you know, IBM Watson beating Jeopardy. We have all these examples, but what's happened is it's accelerated very, very quickly. And it was released to a consumer audience very early. And with really, I would say, no real plan in place. Um, let's see how it goes. Let's release it. And then, you know, they got 100 million users in two months, the fastest growing consumer technology of the world's lifetime. Um, and so I think that's one. The second is that, um, you know, these these tools sometimes can make us believe that they are thinking or that they're reasoning at high, like, and, and not that they are these statistical models that are very, very complex that essentially kind of predict in a very, very complicated way, everybody, the next word. And so that's why it can do something like help you write a beautiful newsletter, but not do a word count. For example, so if you really need that word count for your, you know, abstract submission for that great conference you're going to do, like it can't get to 200 words. And so I think that that is this we really kind of want people to understand that these are kind of computing, predicting, probabilistic tools, not thinking tools. And even though they look like they do and they have personas, that is not the way that they work. So that's two. The third is, hey, everybody, uh, you know, the rhetoric is AI is for cheating. You know, our kids will cheat and they are going to use these tools. And so there are two things that I want to say that kind of underline this. One is that AI detection tools, there's no x-ray glasses or watermark on like synthetic data and synthetic work, whether that's an image or a paper. And in fact, it kind of changes a lot. And those that suggest it to use it, like turn it in. They have, you know, a 0.7 to 1% failure rate where they have false positives, but they also have like a 15 to 20% false negative rate. So they're missing a lot of people as well. So these tools not only do not work, but they can be actually biased again, non-native English speakers. So we really want to like, they could also, they can cause harm in terms of falsely accusing someone. And in fact, I was presenting to a group of um, superintendents in Iowa a couple of weeks ago, and one of the superintendent's daughter was was incorrectly accused of cheating and really really struggled but they can also like really impact those the non-native english speakers and the second thing is that i learned yesterday is that at stanford there's there's been 10 years of research on how kids cheat in high school and so you know this is and what they did is they were like okay now you know ai's for cheating guys like ai's for cheating let's go see if they went back to this high school these high schools and what they found is that there had been no change and like in the amount of cheating that was happening, the cheating was just happening 
in a different format. So those that were cheating already are now just cheating with AI versus the ways in which they were cheating before. And so I think that this is something to understand as well is that this is not like that rhetoric of like, A, you can detect it and B, that it's gonna happen more and more are these places which we have to get out of our heads and the things that we think we know and we need to use evidence to be able to accurately understand the impact of these tools. And that's the thing that we all do. We all are, you know, we love anecdotal data as educators, we love our gut, but realistically some of these cases is that what we're thinking about reality is actually not the case. And it's up for up to us to go ask those questions. That's a perfect segue into the next part of this conversation and, and the next question. So I want us to think a little bit about some really important choices that school leaders need to make now, because I believe, and I, I think you and I talked about this, I think maybe you agree that we're sort of at a fork in the road in terms of the big big questions that school leaders need to ask and then make choices about. And, um, you know, the the topic of cheating kind of fits perfectly with this question um, that came up when you and Tom Vander Ark and I and, and a few others met about a month ago to talk about um, what I had originally really without too much thinking phrased as the integration, the responsible integration of AI and learning, and um, you and Tom reacted very strongly, and I'm glad you did to that phrase, integration of AI. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you and Tom had such a strong reaction to that that word integration? Yeah, well, first of all, um, I, I'm glad you let Tom and I in a room together because I feel like you know, Christian had done this beautiful job of designing this very thoughtful day, and then Tom and I were like, "Wow!" <laughs> and we went, we went in these really beautiful, crazy places where you know it, it is something where this is such an opportunity, especially Middle States Association. You the the reach you have, the opportunity you have to like lean into having that opportunity to help shape how this works in schools across the world is so important. But when we talked about integration and learning, like I think that there were a couple of like reactions and I'll, I won't speak specifically for Tom, but I would say that one is like, there's this, this idea that we will take AI and we will put it into classrooms. And what it will do is it will be the best worksheet creator ever. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use AI to create more worksheets it's going to be the most worksheets, or we're going to continue to replicate these non-effective learning opportunities that already exist. And so why does it, why do we do a five paragraph essay? Why is it not a four paragraph essay or a six paragraph essay? Why are we doing something where we're asking, we're putting stuff in kids' minds and then we're asking it only on a Tuesday in March? Um, why are we doing things like what does learning really mean? And I think we talked about like AI being integrated in learning, like we need to actually reframe what learning is in the age of these tools that are able to do these types of, of writing of if even like, a, like towards reasoning that is coming, like what does that really mean? And then how do we rethink learning and reframe learning? Because the worst thing we could possibly do is say, I'm going to go in, I'm going to put AI into a situation and it's just going to replicate and it's going to make it faster and easier to do bad practice. And so I think that was one piece that was really that we felt pretty strongly was not what we wanted to do. This is definitely not an opportunity to build a system or to reinforce a system that has not helped students prepare for the future, um, prepare, like be global citizens, you know, whatever that looks like. So that's one. Um, so I think that we really wanted to think about like, how does that become part of the conversation of change management of what these tools can do? And then also that, that idea of integrating into learning, we just, we already talked about it. Like these tools are not like ready to be like let loose in a classroom. We also just don't know what the impact of synthetic and artificial relationships will be with young people. And so I was really, really fascinated yesterday in the Sanford conference where the, the superintendent of, South, of um, San Francisco um, Unified was talking about this new K-8 literacy assessment that five-year-olds will take on an iPad. And it was really fascinating from his perspective that kids are using iPads already at home. 
that they have to be able to use these technologies and at that young of age to do these types of assessments because that's just the future. And I think we have these kind of rhetoric, these ideas of what the future is and what technology will be without really kind of going into, do we want to have students having taking high stakes testing on iPads at five years old? And like, what could that impact be? Um, and so the same thing, same thing is that this idea right now of like what it means to like integrate learning or chatbots, like what are the, like, we know that the number one tool that young people use is actually character AI. Mm. So character AI is 18 million avatars. You can create your own. Um, uh, on average, it's used two hours a day. Um, they have group chats where the only way that you know it's a human is you have to go into the project, the group settings. Like you can't even tell out of a group of five what's synthetic or not. And so there's already this movement of like how we're using those tools. Also, there's been uh, there was the idea that students would mostly use this for cheating, but actually they're using it for their mental health and well-being, asking questions for advice, et cetera. And so the reason why I say these kind of ideas around when we think about learning is like, a, like these, like we don't know, we, we need to reframe learning before we integrate any new technology that's going to be this transformative. But secondly, what is the, what is the foundational research and the, and the, the knowledge that we need to have about the impact of these tools, especially in a chatbot interface and or in a, a partner, like the idea of students being able to have these bots that can be their co-pilots. Um, and I think that that was a big place that we were like concerned about that these, these should be conversations instead of just saying, okay, like uh, uh, how many classrooms have AI? Like that, that is the way we think a lot about integrating is like the amount of like integration and that that is actually not our goal with the endorsement and the work that we're doing. Um, and if you are going to integrate these tools, how intentional is it? And like, how is it leading to these students leaving these schools like with durable skills? There's so much to follow up on there, but um, <laughs> I, I, there's one thing in particular that I want to pull out, which is um, this idea of how, how do we even know, or, you know, in, in thinking of a, of a school leader's choice, how does a school leader know how students are using tools that aren't chat GPT, <laughs> like character AI, for example, um, and why are they using those tools? Like, for example, it might not have been obvious uh, before the fact, but once you hear that young people are using, um, you know, character AI or other similar tools for mental health, it makes perfect sense because we know there's a mental health crisis. So, um, one thing school leaders need to do is is figure out how to get the community to start reconsidering great learning. I would say, based on what you just said, another thing, another choice that school leaders need to make is how are we going to understand how and why students are using different tools that we might not even know about? Are there other um, big choices that you think school leaders need to consider when it comes to this sort of next six to 12 months of the conversation? Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think I just want to underline something is that I think that we have this, we get so busy and we have so many competing priorities that we often don't slow down enough to ask the right question. And so like, how could we know how students are using AI? Well, first let's normalize it. So the number one thing we can do is actually creating just simple guidelines and mindsets around the use of AI to normalize its use. So that students and teachers, I've heard teachers actually like starting to hide their own use because they're afraid of like, let's say they're an English language arts teacher and English language arts teachers don't really like ChatGPT. That, that I've heard this happen where a teacher was actually attacked for using this tool that verbally attacked and kind of shunned. And then she stopped talking about it and won't, won't be part of a working group on it. And so whether it's students that are afraid that they're going to be like the fear level, I think, is the really interesting thing here is that kids understand that this is this could be cheating if it does all your work. But they're also now afraid that you're going to accuse them of cheating in ways that they've never been accused of cheating before. And I think that that's something that is happening. But what we aren't doing is we're not taking the step back and saying, hey, this is a, an unprecedented time in our lives. What does this actually mean for our school community? And ask those questions and taking the time to do it, whether it is a simple survey, it could be a one in 10. I don't know if you've ever done that, but a walkthrough where you ask one out of 10 people that like, as you walk through as your principal or you're even whatever instructional lead or whatever, and you ask three questions that are the same. Like, that's a great way to get really strong. Like just, you know, it's still gonna be 
um, kind of a small sample, but one out of 10 is pretty good. And it gives you some idea of, of what's happening across your school community. So I think it's just really, really important for us to take the time and carve out that time to ask those right questions, because you're going to be able to support the actual adoption of these tools better when you understand where people are coming from, which is really important. The second thing is, if I had my magic wand, what I would do is I would ensure that everyone across your school community, and I mean parents too, and your staff and everyone within your school community, has at least an hour or 90 minutes of high quality practical AI literacy training. Uh, and I say high quality and I say practical because it can't just be like, here, go do, but like it needs to be like something that is targeted and high quality. But also we see over and over again, if I went in front of the people that we've worked with and just talked about AI, they would go away with maybe some understandings, but they're not going to have that hands on keyboard. So that's why that prompt library is so important is that it situates you in real life and value creation. And so as soon as we create value for that individual teacher or leader or even student, they immediately think about how I'm going to pass this along to people in my life. And so I think that it has to be that practical aspect of it. The third is to start to think about your plan of terms of like our, you know, as you're looking to create um, or bring in pilots or to think about even creating your own tools that are going to be easier and easier to create, like the GPTs that have been replaced, released by um, OpenAI, which is this ability to create a trained version of a, a bot that works off a document or documentation. And so it's going to be something more targeted. And so I think that there are these opportunities now, like to start thinking through a strategic plan. And, you know, we have some questions for ed techs that we have that we can, we can find on our website. And we're working towards that responsible framework of Gen AI tools so you can ask good questions. But like, what are, where are you going to do it? Where is the place in which you want to use AI tools? And also it doesn't have to be generative AI. It could be something, there are some great early reading, early math, remediation. Um, TeachFX is a great example if you really want to support your teachers on like their like wait time and the way that they approach. Mm -hmm. And those tools are not just generative AI. Like mm -hmm. you can really start to think through like what are the places in which maybe I'm gonna start with an AI tool that is not using generative AI, meaning that they have these very like, it's very clear that it doesn't make mistakes, it doesn't make things up and it's not going to be biased against your, you know, your students. And then at the other, and then like, where is that place? And I'm also going to bring in one or two generative AI tools to like start bringing in um, this hands-on keyboard understanding and try to find that value. I think that that's the best thing that we can do. But there's no, I, I mean, there's a need for AI literacy like never before. And I need to make your, your teacher's lives easier at, like never before. And so those are the two things you can do right now. But then that idea of integration that we talked about, like that thoughtful integration, I really believe should be stepped. Um, and should be thoughtful and evidence-based and intentional, knowing that these tools are the worst they will ever be today, yesterday, and like they will be better, like literally better by the end of next year, we will be having a different conversation. Maybe six months from now, we'll be having a different conversation. Abs absolutely. Yeah. I want to um, I want to go deeper on two things you said and pull them together because as a a former school leader myself, this is probably my greatest preoccupation with the explosion of generative AI. And it's not so much about the AI tools themselves, but rather what I think as the, the further deracination or even obliteration of our attention. And you said, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, we have to devote time to these conversations. We have to slow down because we have so much stuff going on. And God knows if you've worked in a school, there's, <laughs> there's no end of things to fill up a school day and a school year. And it's no surprise that research shows that, you know, basically people start, at, you know, in September with high energy. And then it's just like a downward slope until the end of the year, because there is so much. And yet, and this is my point of view as a, as a former school leader, the, the single most important resource we have is our attention. What are we paying attention to? So it sounded like what you were suggesting is that one of the great choices, one of the, the huge choices that a school leader needs to make is not only to decide what are the conversations we are going to have that we need to have, whether that's around how students are using it, whether it's doing the one in 10 walk around, which I love. I've never heard of that before. It's a brilliant idea. 
um, or doing PD for everybody. That all makes great sense in terms of focusing attention here, but we also, it's zero, attention zero sum. So it sounds like you're also saying we might have to start deciding what are we not going to pay attention to, or what are we going to pay less attention to, to create room for these new conversations? Yeah, and I just want to to underline why I think it's so important that that people in this work understand how schools work because there's this kind of no brainer like why wouldn't you just do blah right and we hear that all the time and I know that you know, you know you school years here like you have such a complex ecosystem like every day like if you're a teacher even like okay which kid is not feeling well which one didn't get sleep who hasn't eaten you know, the bell's going to ring, like there's an intercom, someone needs to be taken, there's a piece of paper I need to sign. Like, I, I understand the complexity of even those moments in time, right? And the same thing that gets exacerbated and gets bigger and gets more complicated the further up you go in, in, in the school. And so I don't want to, I don't want to absolutely, I don't want to undercut that or elide it. But I do want to say is that there are moments in time where things have to shift, and, you know, you, you have to, to make hard decisions about what you will prioritize. And it does mean that the, this is not a, it sometimes is a zero sum game. Sometimes it really is like, we have to, to do this, we, we're replacing something with this. And I understand that. And it's a very hard decision. But I think that this is one of those times in which we really need to make that decision to, to, to do this work intentionally. And the reason why, I, so actually someone in the channel, I appreciate um, Dana, uh, no, is it Dana? Sorry, that, that um, yeah, Dana uh, sent us a message, Dana Watts, thank you for sharing that she, you know, doing a, offering a webinar, supporting teachers, but there's this backlash of like, there's just this, this fear about it. And what I see all the time is that it's not just we want to spend time on this, but it has to be the right time, the right approach with the right people. And so we actually get called in a lot from people that want to do this because it's almost like you need an expert outside the school because it doesn't need to be another thing where teachers are so good at ignoring other things. I'm sorry for every teacher here. I will take responsibility of ourselves. We sometimes believe it is a hype cycle and we're going to put something in the like, you know, the closet and then we're going to close our door and we keep doing what we're doing and it will disappear. And we have that habit that sometimes you have to like not only prioritize it, but like bring someone in or do something in a way that like it has to be like a big deal almost. And then what you do is you then provide a way again, it has to be practical. And then I think that this is the idea now that like when we, we do this work, like can you integrate it? So for example, we've done sessions where it was going to be a, a universal design uh, UDL conference day, like a day. And so instead of just UDL, it was UDL and AI. You know, or it was the Legal Institute at, you know, Rhode Island Superintendent Association. And then it's Legal Institute and AI, you know. And so like we did is we got hamstrung in, but then it really shifted and changed the way that we did something. So maybe there are some workarounds in which you have something that already kind of exists on your, your plate, and then you integrate generative AI in meaningful ways into that. Um, but I think at this moment, so we're working towards uh, building a toolkit around AI literacy day for this reason completely. And like the commitment is not a full day, but like, can you commit to 45 minutes of learning across your school community? And we'll support you in doing that. But like, this is an example of like why we want to, to really create these spaces in which it doesn't have to be so crazy. It doesn't have to be, you know, 25 different PD sessions, but if it's done really intentionally, it's made a priority and you're creating something that has value and is meaning and is practical, then that's what I think matters right now. And I cannot underline it enough. Like if it's like, I have never had a hard room doing this work and it's a new technology and people are afraid of it. And if you like, it is amazing how much openness to learning, to trying, to understanding. It is unlike anything I have ever done. And my favorite anecdote before I hand it back over is like one of the first sessions we ever did was the end of last year you know, we start with an AI in your pocket, like how is AI, like what's in your pocket? And like this physics teacher was like, I have a flip phone. And he was very excited that he had a flip phone. And I'm like, I love, I, you're my favorite person to talk to in a room, but he was like very proud of himself that he did not have AI in his pocket. And we started going through the session. We went through our, you know, our, our ability to like talk about concerns and myths and facts, the tech it's a bit as well. And then we started prompting and I, I, I swear this guy was started. He just started yelling prompts at me. He was just like, try this, 
try this one, try that one. Like, and he went from so proud of him, like of being like, a t- like someone that isn't technically like he's, he's decided making decision about his use of technology and then being so open to want to try and so curious in half an hour. And I think that that is what I want to underline here is that there is that capacity interest if you can make it work for people. Yeah, it, it brings to mind that uh, great quote from Arthur C. Clarke that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And there is something magical about putting the prompt in or shouting it out and having somebody else put it in and getting a response within, as you said earlier, 10 seconds. That's kind of mind blowing. Um, I want to say one more thing. And then I had other questions, but there are a lot of questions in the chat. Um, so I want to I want to get to our audience's questions first. Um, but the one thing I want to say is just to kind of maybe uh, bring some closure to that extended conversation about making time for this, stewarding people's attention. That means saying no to things or doing less of certain things. And then you said, you know, this can't just be another thing. I couldn't agree more with you. It's probably, if not the single most, it's one of the top three most critical things that teachers have to say about new initiatives, or this is just another thing. Um, And as school leaders, um, we are by definition change leaders. We don't get to pick whether we're leading change or not. We have to. And so if we're going to lead change and we're going to ask people to shift their attention away from things that they may be, and frankly, probably are attached to emotionally and socially, um, that's five stages of grief stuff. Like people have, to, we have to be prepared for people to feel angry, to feel defensive, to be in denial, um, to be in grief and mourning over things that are being lost. And that has nothing to do with AI, but it has everything to do with the people who are going to be using the AI to support kids. Um, and then Absolutely. the other thing, the other thing you said that I, I, I just want to really draw a line under, because I think it's so important is that. Um, you said something like, at least in, in my my primitive notes here, something like, you know, there are moments in time when things have to shift and you have to make hard decisions. And it brings to mind this question that I hope everybody on this webinar is thinking about. I know we obsess over it at, at Middle States. And again, it's not about AI itself. It, it's what do you stand for and what mm-hmm. will you stand for? Um, because if you have to make hard decisions, you should make them based on on the things that you believe in and stand for that are about your your deep mission and purpose in the world. Okay, so lots of questions from um, from the audience and I'm gonna try to kind of sort these a little bit. Um, one very practical one, uh, I saw this in the chat float by while, while we were talking, I brought up the one in 10 walk. That was the first time I had yeah. heard of it. But somebody, I guess, must have joined later and didn't hear you describe it. So could you just describe that one more time? Oh, absolutely. So what I say, so I don't know, I mean, you, you all don't know me, but um, my last job is running a survey and analytics company in Australia, and uh, I'm a researcher as well. And so I think that like, for me, I think a lot about like the ways in which we research in schools. And so you can do this really formal survey and like you can do this work. And and often the, the what we know about uh, getting feedback is that um, unless the feedback is is like there's an actual reason for what you're asking and then you do something with it and you share what you did with it it really does like someone might do like a, respond to a survey once with like their full heart and mind and then when they don't hear anything about it they never think about it again so there are other ways to kind of unpick this and so one of the ways is that when you think about like a question that you have so you have this big question that you want to ask then instead of just like doing something in which you write a survey and maybe 10% of people complete it, what you do is you can take an opportunity and what you do is you just kind of pick 10% of your population and you can do that through a walkthrough where you're just in the halls and every like 10 person you see, you talk to and you ask those questions and you make sure that it's a representative sample in the sense of it's teachers, it's students, whatever you want to do. And you take your notes with you. You can now use AI to like, you know, transcribe it with permission. And then that's that way of getting that like really, really strong, um, like, like feedback, right? And that, and then getting that representative feedback. There are other ways to do this too, but I just love that this is something that it's kind of cool though, because people start to expect it. So I know school leaders that have done this before where like the kids like, and like leaders felt heard. And then also like, if it's a big thing, like every two weeks, there's another walkthrough, right? And I think that that's where it gets really neat to do. And this is a perfect example of this because you can go and say, okay, we could do this survey, but let's go out and actually say like, okay, you talk to Joe and Edwina 
and you know all these different seasons and then ask just one question have you used ai if so how or ask another question if you're like, like if i could teach you anything about ai what would it be or have you know do you think ai is for cheating let's go really provocative right but something like that and you do it regularly it's, it maybe takes a, you know, an hour of your time to do that as a walk through your, your school. It doesn't have to be 10%, but it's kind of that idea of it, but you're getting this real time feedback and you're listening to your, your, your stakeholders. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a question. I saw this at the beginning of the session and, and it's in this uh, separate uh, Google doc. We have the Q and A, we have the chat, but I, I also have uh, <laughs> the middle States team keeping a separate Google doc where they're pulling all these things into one place. And I, I, I'm actually curious myself about this question. Amna um, Afsal asked, is there an AI literary, literacy scale? You said you're working on, an, on a literacy toolkit. Do you have a scale or have you seen scales out there about degrees of literacy? So there are some some different frameworks. Um, I know that Pat's here from um, code.org and teachai.org. Um, I know there's a toolkit um, and other pieces. There, I haven't seen a... like. It's really interesting because the continuums or the frameworks of like AI literacy, I think that are um, really not fully baked yet all the way. And I think part of it's because the technology is moving so quickly. Um, we focus instead of on a continuum into like mindsets. So we have these these supports and tools than which we create like our 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 suggestion for a policy or are are really mindsets. Like, how does a student know how to use these tools by a knowing that it's important to ask permission to evaluate the use case to track their work and to be able to submit that and, and be comfortable citing it and only using it in specific use cases and so that's the way that we handle ai literacy at least right now but as we're building the toolkit we will definitely be putting something more formal in if you know anything about us um you'll, you'll notice that we have almost no articles in fact i've only ever written one article instead we have like a ton of classroom resources and resources a lot of video a lot of webinars and our prompt library which is kind of it's always amazing like your modalities but for us like that's the way that I think in terms of like can we create a framework and so but if you're looking to do this I think the most important thing that you want to do is that like you want to have essentially this I, I think you have to be very cognizant of if I'm in a room of a 10 people or 100 people there are people that have never used it that use it all the time that think it's the worst thing that ever happened think it's the best thing that's ever happened uh are scared or believe if you don't want, you know, if you don't get on the bus, you're going to get run over. And that's in a room of 10, 100, 1,000. And so the idea here is that we want to take that moment to understand where your audience is at. And then your ultimate goal is like for us is this idea of critical use. Like, can we make good decisions about when and how to use and when to trust? And so I'm just, is it okay if I like, like we have a couple of resources, like, so I, we could, I could put them in the chattel, but maybe there'd be something. Is it possible for me to share my screen for a minute just to show Absolutely. people a couple yep. of those things? Go for it. Um, so I just want to, uh, I could just throw these in the chat, but I just want to kind of go through some of the frameworks that we have that might be helpful. Um, and so this is one, and there were a lot of questions in the chat, not to steal your thunder, Christian, but I oh. like, this is one that came up a bunch of like, how are you making good decisions about like how to buy? So this is actually a PDF. Um, it's one of the first things we created because I got frustrated with these new tools coming out that didn't actually have best practices in mind. And so we have this, um, this is a six questions to ask Gen AI ed tech tools. So things around like the capabilities, bias and everything from evidence to impact. So it's something like this use this, ask these questions of these tools and see what they say. And if they say like, you know, we solved hallucinations, they probably haven't. So ask for receipts, so to speak. But this is an hmm. example of how to do that. Um, the second is this idea of the, the mindsets. And so we have some frameworks, but some mindsets. So this is one of our pieces, which is like uh, how to use um, AI in a, like for students that follow. And so it's a lot about mindsets in the terms of like, what can I use it for? And what should I not use it for? And we include, this one's a little bit controversial, but we still believe that like research, there are better opportunities to research, especially if you want to use quotes or dates, because that's something that often hallucinates. And then this idea of responsible use, when you talk about like frameworks, um, of this idea of like, how do you use AI responsibly every time? And so like, that is like, for us, like when we think about the literacy continuum, if someone can do this, if someone can understand that, like, it, like you need to actually evaluate, you need to verify, you need to keep 
prompting and editing and revising, but also that you are responsible, that ChatGPT is not running you, you're running ChatGPT. So if you say that ChatGPT gave it to me, like, but that's not like, in fact, that should actually be the moment when which you evaluate and that you, you continue to be the agentic part of this. And actually, if you use this, not only for responsible, but your best, like your knowledge, it's just going to get such a better output. So these are kind of resources that we have that are fully available and we continue to build them like we're, um, really want to create the space. Also, like if you wanted just a simple policy, we have an example of a simple policy that you can submit. But all of these things, like while they're not like full, like, um, you know, like end-to-end toolkits, they are these starting places and these, like even if you just do one of these, like it can create this space in which you're all moving in the same direction as you're building that literacy. Yeah, um, you called out um, Pat, from uh, code.org and from Teach AI. And, and he's put a couple of questions in the chat and uh, his questions are, some of his questions are related to other questions that I wanna venture a, a stab at and then would love to hear your response to. So some version of, you know, if teachers are skeptical, how do we get them interested or engaged? Um, how do we guide, what, what guidance do we provide to teachers? Um, and someone asked something kind of similar around um, students and appropriate use. And obviously the resources you just shared speak partly to that. Um, my feeling is that maybe the most practical thing to do for the skeptics or the confused folks or just sort of the newbies is, is create sandbox experiences, as you said earlier, where people can just play and you know, not run the risk of breaking anything, you know, don't introduce uh, usage in a high stakes scenario where a teacher might give an assessment that's going to have a grade and a grade book, right? That's, that's a little bit risky to do. But if it's uh, a PD session, um, and a, a, what I'm referring to as a sandbox session, I think that that's um, probably the most practical thing I can recommend. I'm curious, Amanda, if you have other advice for um, how to get people engaged who might be skeptical or resistant or or otherwise confused about what to do. Yeah, and I think that that sandbox, that safe space, that ability for protective failure, like all those things are really important. This is not a this is a show not tell time, everybody. Like we have to show what that works. And so I love like when um, I see. Um, school leaders or teachers saying, I used it for this and it is so cool. And here's my example of how to do it. And like, like people go, Ooh, okay. Like you can use it for this. I didn't know you can use it for this. And then like you go and you, and you do, and you try. Um, what I would say is that like the, there are, this is not the most intuitive technology. So I think it's just gotta be very, very, you just have to be very cognizant even those sandboxes that, you know, if someone stops after one prompt or if the output isn't great, their reaction usually is the technology doesn't work. And I always have to have these funny conversations where it's like, it's you, not it. It's like the opposite of the Dear John. Like, you know, so sorry, Christian, it's you. Like you need, like we need to think about this prompt framework. That's why we developed one. Like you need it, like the better you ask it in the way you ask it. So let's try Like, so our ultimate goal is like spend the next 10 minutes identifying an area that you can use help from. And we have a slide that's like written communication, lesson planning, like whatever, like the, the things that it does pretty well. Let's go with a goal and let's, let's try to get there and let's, let's, let's be resilient. And if you get stuck, like you can use something like our prompt library or other people, you can use a new context window if you like, if it isn't quite working, but let's go and do that. And then what we're going to do is like, we're going to take that and then we're going to share our, what we design and understand. And like, if you can create those spaces where like everyone's like, all of a sudden, like I can create a great rubric, like you're going to see these light bulbs. And I, my, my favorite thing at a conference, the only conference we've been to so far, like, a, you know, it was pretty early in the stage. So people weren't quite ready to talk about it. But what I did is like, if a principal walked by, I said, do you want me to teach you how to use ChatGPT? And they would like, sure. And so I taught like 80 principals in like five minutes how to use ChatGPT. But I wish I had a camera because the, the reactions were everything from stoic, I'm thinking about this, to all the way like, hands up, you've changed my life. You mean I can write a reference letter like thoughtfully and like to 90% to support my students getting into college? Like, okay, I'm in. Or like, you know, at this newsletter, like I can create a beautiful thing. And I think that that is the power of this, but it has to, again, be intentional, practical and value driven. 
Yeah. I am so tired. And it's actually quite funny. And we'll, this is like, I know we're coming in time, but I have been in bad PD. The goal of this is not to be bad PD again. Like you can do this in a way that everyone in that room is going to have that great moment of like, I could use this to make my life easier. And maybe, maybe there's a chance that like we can make schools better with this technology if it's done in that intentional way. Totally. Um, but just a few things before we end, uh, I posted a link and Audra posted a link. It's the same survey from the beginning, but it's a different version of that survey. Uh, it's, the wording is slightly different. So if you could just share one word um, about how you're thinking about things uh, as we come to a conclusion, that would be great. And uh, second, someone asked this in the chat. I just want to uh, let you know, we're going to send a follow-up email with the resources that Amanda shared and other resources that we recommend. Those are largely in the Google Doc that's also been posted in the chat, but you'll get a follow-up email with that. So look for that as well as a recording of this webinar. Um, I also want to let everybody know that our next webinar, which is on December 12th, is with Adam Bryant, uh, the author of Leap to Leader. He is the creator of the Corner Office interview series in the New York Times and um, has interviewed well over a thousand um, executives from for-profit, non-profit, public service organizations. And his new book is actually about another of these tectonic shifts we think about a lot at Middle States, which is um, the shifting uh, landscape of talent identification, recruitment, growth, development, um, and fulfillment. Um, so hopefully we'll see many of you there. I wanna say a huge thank you to you, yeah, Amanda, this was awesome. Um, exceeded my expectations, which were high to begin with. I'm really grateful for um, just really the mission-driven uh, spirit that you bring to these conversations and for your help with uh, the AI advisory team for Middle States. And I hope that the audience finds real value in this conversation about how to be a change maker in education, because we all are, whether we want to be or not, as I said earlier. Um, so I hope that this conversation provided you all with some great tools and you can expect to hear from us again soon. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye, everybody.